I'm really excited about this morning's session. We're going to be talking about the rural-urban divide and its impacts on politics in Alberta. Um, and I was saying to our speakers here this morning, you know, our provincial politics is very theatrical and very frustrating at times, and it gets a lot of attention. But what's really going to be crucial in the moments ahead is these issues that are emerging um, in municipal politics and in our rural parts of Alberta. So I'm very excited to hear that perspective from our speakers today. First up, we will have uh, Jack Lucas speaking to the rural-urban divide in Alberta, attitudes, identities, and voting. And Jack is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Calgary. He's also the author of multiple books, dozens of refereed journal articles, um, speaking to this topic on, on rural-urban identity and how that impacts municipal politics. What I'm going to try and do this morning is try and give you a kind of a big-picture overview of some aspects of urban-rural divides in Alberta. Try to put Alberta into some comparative perspective, uh, comparing Alberta's urban-rural divides to what we see elsewhere in Canada. Um, now, we all know that the urban-rural divide has been important in Alberta, uh, in Alberta elections and politics and voting going back a very long time. Um, and it's certainly a big part of the discourse today. Just this week, there was a, a column by Jason Markasoff in uh, CBC Calgary in which he distinguished between Calgary, Edmonton, and what he somewhat unfortunately called other land. But when you read the article, what you see actually is even within the so-called other land, there are these distinctive urban-rural differences in voting patterns and the outcome of the recent by-election. Many of us are familiar with this uh, interview that Rick Bell did about a month ago with Premier Smith, where the Premier made it clear that she intends to make an explicitly rural appeal in the next election, even if that comes at the cost of uh, several seats in Calgary. So when we're thinking about doing democracy better, the theme of this conference, when we're thinking about the kinds of coalitions that can or could be built in Alberta today, I think being attending to the political geography and particularly the urban-rural divides that exist in this province is really important. So that's what I'll try and do today is just give you some background and kind of a, an empirical foundation for that conversation. So to do this, I'm going to focus on three themes, issues, identities, and ideology. I'm going to take you through citizens' attitudes on particular policy issues, using survey data to show you some of the urban-rural divides there. I'll then talk uh, a little bit about place identities and place-based resentment and how that varies across places. And then I'll just say something briefly about uh, ideological self-perceptions and how those vary as well. You know, this isn't a spy novel, so I'll just tell you the ending right now, so you know what to expect. I'm going to show you that there are substantial urban-rural divides in Alberta today, but that these divides are actually quite similar to what we see in other parts of Canada, particularly other big provinces. What makes Alberta distinctive isn't so much the existence or magnitude of the urban-rural divides, but as we'll see, some of the, what I'm calling the intercept shift, something that we're all quite familiar with, a kind of rightward lean, both on some policy issues in Alberta and on ideological self-perception in Alberta. That's my down payment on what's to come. Let's get into it, starting with issue positions. To what extent do urban and rural Albertans agree or disagree on policy issues? To answer this question, I'm going to show you data from one of the biggest surveys of Canadians ever undertaken, the 2019 Canadian Election Study Survey. I'm going to show you differences in urban and rural attitudes uh, from that survey using a measure of the urban and rural character of the districts in which Canadians live. Uh, this is a measure that I built with some colleagues at Western, Zach Taylor and, and Dave Armstrong. So what I've done here is I've taken the survey data, I used it to make estimates of what the average position or opinion is in each of Canada's 338 federal electoral districts. Using this technique that we like to call Mr. P, uh, I will say nothing more about it, I promise, but if you're interested, we can geek out on Mr. P after the panel. This allows us to just compare how urban and rural Canadians uh, differ or resemble one another on issues. This is what the comparison is going to look like. I'm going to walk you through how to interpret this plot because uh, I'll show you a few issues this way. The purple circles is the average opinion of residents in the most urban riding in that province. And then the green circles 
It's an average opinion of residents in the least urban riding in that province. So this gives us a way to compare within province differences without uh, acknowledging the fact that the baseline levels of urbanization in different provinces are going to vary. So we can compare within provinces this way. Along the side, I'm just reporting the overall size of the urban-rural gap on those issues. So that's just the most urban minus the most rural. And then just so you're aware, I'm sorting each of these plots from the biggest to the smallest gap so that the order of the provinces will change as we go through these issues. So let's actually look at this first plot. The statement is this country would have many fewer problems if there was more emphasis on traditional family values. Again, all of these issues are from the Canadian Election Study Survey. Notice here that this issue strongly divides urban and rural Canadians. In the most rural riding in each province, a majority agrees with this statement. In the most urban riding in each province, a majority disagrees with this statement. So this is a particularly strong urban-rural divide, and you can also see that there are very large gaps between the average opinion in the urban place and the rural place, and that's true across all of the big and many of the medium-sized provinces. So other thing to notice here, there's not much difference between what we see in Alberta and what we see in the other big provinces. Um, like the other provinces, Alberta has a very large urban-rural gap on this issue, but it doesn't look much different from the other provinces in the location of the purple and green circles or the size of the gap. And this is a, a pattern that we can see on a number of issues. So here's a free trade question. There should be more free trade with other countries even if it hurts some industries in Canada. You can see overall Canadians are in a bit of a trade skeptical frame of mind these days. Neither the urban nor the rural circles reach majority approval in any province. You can see there are rural and urban gaps on this. There's more support for free trade in urban places in Canada than in the rural. But once again you see Alberta looks quite similar to the other provinces here. Here's another example of this type, an anti-immigrant sentiment question. Canada's culture is generally harmed by immigrants. Thankfully, the overall level of anti-immigrant sentiment in Canada remains low, by at least by uh, cross-national standards. Even in the most rural districts, the average sentiment is nowhere close to a majority support for this statement. But once again, you see that there are these very large gaps between urban and rural districts, and Alberta doesn't really stand out here as distinctive. Now let me show you the other story. When we turn to policy questions related to the oil and gas sector, um, the pattern changes. And this uh, statement here is a, is a statement about federal government support for the energy sector, specifically pipeline construction. You can see there are substantial urban-rural gaps on this question. The urban-rural gap in Alberta is really no different than what we see in other provinces. What is different is that Alberta's entire segment, both the purple and the green circles, are shifted rightward. So there's a distinctively high level of agreement with this statement in Alberta, even though, despite that shift, the, the urban-rural gap persists. It's just the entire opinion environment is shifted in one direction. And this is a particularly dramatic example, but the basic pattern reappears on a number of similar questions. Question about support for the carbon tax. Lower values here mean more skepticism or less support for the carbon tax. So you can see on this question, the Alberta circles are shifted in the other direction more skepticism about the carbon tax here in this province. But the same very large urban-rural divide that we see in other provinces. Jobs versus the environment. This has become a kind of a standard question. There are people who would reject the premise of this question. But if there is a conflict between protecting the environment and creating jobs, what should come first? You can see that Alberta is the only place where in the most rural district there's a majority agreement for this statement. Um, so this one kind of crosses that 50% threshold. Summarizing the issue story here, what do we see? We see substantial gaps in average policy attitudes when we compare rural and urban districts in Alberta. Gaps in average support on these issue statements regularly in the 10 percentage point, 20 percentage point, even 30 percentage point differences. And what that means is if you take a random person out of an urban district in Alberta and you ask them these questions, and then you take a random person out of a district in rural Alberta and ask them the same questions, the probability that they will have these uh, very different attitudes on the questions is, is quite high. There's large gaps in, in those issue positions. But also important is that these gaps are not notably bigger than what we see in other provinces in Canada. This is a Canadian phenomenon, these urban-rural issue divides, not so much an Alberta phenomenon. Where, where Alberta is distinctive is in that rightward shift 
that we can see particularly on questions related to the energy sector, carbon taxes, and environmental policy. Okay, so part two, place identity. Another important component of urban-rural divides is place identity and place resentment. Now, social scientists like me define place identity as the extent to which we identify with the kind of place where we live. So this isn't just about where I live, but do I think of myself as an urban person or a rural person? Do I think of myself as someone who has a lot in common with other urban people or rural people? So to what extent does this become a meaningful social identity akin to other politically salient social identities like gender identity or race identity or partisan identity? To the extent that that place identity creates a sense in, in people's minds that their place type, the kind of place they identify with is overlooked or disrespected or poorly represented, that uh, becomes place resentment, which you can think of as kind of the flip side of the coin, the sort of out-group resentment side of the in-group place identity coin. There's some great research in this area. There's a, a foundational book by Kathy Kramer called The Politics of Resentment. And then my co-panelist, Clark Vanek, has written a, a, just a brilliant um, kind of uh, replication analysis of, of Kathy Kramer's study here in Alberta focused on place-based resentment. I must say, not just a great paper, but an award-winning paper. So congratulations to uh, Professor Vanek. I'm just going to give you kind of big picture perspective, and then Clark's going to fill in, uh, I think, a lot of interesting and important detail here. Last thing I'll say by way of preface is I'm not going to tell you much about how we measure place identity and place resentment in these surveys. We can talk about that if, if you are interested. I'm happy to. I'll just tell you that this is work that I've been doing with a, a colleague of mine, Sophie Borwin, who's a, a really uh, a brilliant young a political scientist at, at Simon Fraser University. Let's start with place resentment. Again, I'll just walk you through what this figure is showing you. Vertical axis is showing the level of place resentment from low to high. So high values means that people feel resentful toward the other places, the outgroup places. Along the bottom, I have the provinces, and you can see if you're particularly keen-eyed that I've combined the Atlantic provinces into one group just for reasons of sample size. So it's difficult for me also, I should say, to present survey data without communicating something about the uncertainty of the estimate, so I've also included 95% confidence intervals. Speaking of social identity, this is my form of identification with my fellow nerds. We see here, it seems like when we look at the overall picture, place resentment, if anything, looks a bit lower in Alberta than in the other provinces. But what we really want to do is break this out into urban, suburban, and rural places, because that's really those are the meaningful groups, I think, that we're interested in. When we do that, we see that Alberta, again, doesn't look much different from the rest of Canada. Alberta's the green bars in, in each of these plots. Fairly similar levels of place-based resentment in Alberta among urban, people who identify as urban, suburban, and rural. But you'll also see that the rural resentment is consistently higher across Canada than the other groups. So people who identify as rural feel more resentment toward urban and suburban places than urban and suburban people feel toward each other or toward rural places. So there's higher levels of place-based resentment in rural Canada. And that's true in Alberta, just as it's true in other parts of Canada. As I say, Clark is going to have more in better and smarter things to say about place resentment. So I'm going to move on to place identity here. Like I say, kind of the flip side of the coin and a slightly more complicated picture, but basically the story here, again, not much difference between Alberta and other parts of Canada. If you squint your eyes and turn your head and really overinterpret the data, you might say rural identity is stronger in Alberta and Saskatchewan than elsewhere in Canada, but the slightly higher rural bars there for those provinces is not really substantively very large and not statistically significant either. Slightly higher levels of place-based identity in rural Canada. Uh, the difference is not as pronounced as what we see with rural resentment. Um, and similar picture in Alberta to what we see elsewhere in Canada. So, summary, both place identity and place resentment are stronger among rural Albertans than among suburban or urban Albertans, and that's defined as how a person sees themselves, whether they see themselves as an urban person, a rural person, or a suburban person. And once again, I think I want to suggest that this is a Canadian phenomenon, and perhaps an international phenomenon, ultimately, rather than um, something peculiar to Alberta. Okay, last step, ideology and the urban-rural divide. We tend to think of rural places as a bit more right-leaning, 
they, residents who think of themselves as a bit more right-leaning and urban places as, as a bit more left-leaning. Does this particular uh, factoid hold true in Alberta? Well, yes. Here what we have is the respondents' ideological self-placement. So we're talking about how they think of themselves ideologically from left to right. On the vertical axis, left is low and right is high values. And then on the horizontal axis, you have the kind of place where they live, the most rural to the most urban. The relationship here that I'm summarizing is the gray line is all of the respondents who are not in Alberta from this survey. The green line is all of the Albertans. And you can see here that there's a gentle but downward slope for both of these lines across the plot. It's gentle because many, many, many Canadians place themselves at or near the very center of the ideological distribution. And so that pulls the overall averages toward the center, regardless of where we're looking in Canada. And that's why the lines don't seem to move very much. But there is this downward slope, and if we use slightly more sophisticated methods to tease it out, we can see it's quite clear that people in urban Canada are going to be more likely to place themselves a bit further to the left than people in rural Canada. But what's interesting in keeping with the kind of argument that I made about issues is this gap between the two lines. Is that at each point along that distribution from rural to urban places, we see that uh, with the exception of the very most urban parts of uh, Alberta, Albertans have a tendency to position themselves a bit further to the right than their counterparts in other parts of Canada. So um, this is another kind of intercept shift gap story akin to the one that I showed you with the policy issues. If you're analytically skeptical, you might say, well, it's kind of unfair to compare Alberta to all the rest because maybe there's lots of differences among the provinces. But if we break it out where each of those gray lines is its own province, the story is the same. Alberta still is up there at the top with a distinctive gap past the other provinces in ideological self-perceptions. It is the case that ideological self-understanding shift leftward as we move from rural to urban Canada. This is about how people think of themselves, the words they use to define their own political positions, like conservative or progressive, left or right. But that intercept shift that I, that I pointed out in the policy issues uh, breakdown reappears here as well. So, summary. Urban-rural divides, I think, play, hopefully you will agree, based on some of the data that I've shown you, they play a really important role in Alberta politics. We know this. This isn't just a function of some kind of uh, institutional feature of how we get people elected through single-member plurality districts or something. There are real underlying differences in policy attitudes, place-based identities, place-based resentment, and, and ideological self-perceptions. But these divides are quite similar to what we see in other provinces. Thinking about the implications of that, one implication is that this is not, if it's not a distinctively Alberta phenomenon, then the opportunities to learn from what's going on in other places are high. Because um, if there are coalitions being constructed elsewhere uh, across ur urban and rural divides, if it's the case that um, it's increasingly difficult for those kinds of coalitions to be built in other places. We have lessons that I think we can learn from those experiences elsewhere in Canada, and indeed in other countries for politics here. And then lastly, of course, where, where Alberta does look distinctive is in this thing I called the intercept shift, with the caveat that I'm talking here about what the public thinks, not necessarily what the outputs of the government are in terms of policy, and so we might see different patterns if we look at the kinds of, um, you know, whether it's spending or uh, just um, the passage of particular kinds of legislation, that would be a useful but different story to tell. Second, though, and I think the most important caveat, is that there's huge variation here across policy domains. In some policy domains, Albertans look no different from their counterparts elsewhere in Alberta. An urban Albertan looks no different from an urban Ontarian um, or even Quebecer. Uh, on many issues. It's really in particular areas of public policy, the, the areas that are quite unsurprising, um, that we see that that intercept shift is particularly prominent. That's a kind of 40,000 foot overview. I hope that it's useful to sort of give us a, a baseline for talking about these divides uh, here in Alberta. Again, just uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and have a chance to share this stuff with you. So thanks very much.
Thanks so much, Jack. I'd like to now introduce Clark Bannock. He will be speaking to political resentment in rural Alberta. This draws a lot on his ongoing ethnographic uh, work in rural communities in Alberta. So Dr. Clark Bannock is the director of the Alberta Centre for Sustainable Rural Communities and an adjunct professor at Augustana campus for uh, University of Alberta. Just recently, Clark was the recipient of the CPSA, Canadian Political Science Association, John McMenemy Prize. And um, in the meantime, take it away, Clark. Thank you very much. Just to begin, a, a quick plug. It was just mentioned that I'm the director of the Alberta Centre for Sustainable Rural Communities at the University of Alberta. We're, we're a research institution here at the university uh, that does research and outreach projects uh, in support of rural communities and rural organizations on all manner of topics from, you know, economic development to mental health supports to, uh, you know, environmental sustainability. We do a lot of different work uh, for rural. Jack has kind of already given a bit of a preview of what I'm going to speak about, kind of this rural resentment, is, and in particular, a, a study I did a couple, three years ago now. Before I get into that, I, I should ad admit, and I, I admit this in my paper as well, because I think it's an important methodological, methodological point to to just throw on the table. Uh, I myself am, am a rural Albertan. I'm a farm kid. I still live on a gravel road in the middle of, middle of rural Alberta. Um, I own rifles. I attend the, you know, the local country church. I drove up here this morning in my F-150. So all of those identifiers that scare all of you, you know, they're, they're here in, in, in me. Actually, I threw this slide in just to, just to remind myself, not to get too, too ahead of myself, not to bog us down. I'm, in all of the debate around this, but to be perfectly honest, especially for those who work with rural communities and work on rural issues, defining rural is infamously tricky. There are a whole host of different ways to think about what rural actually is. Probably, you know, the, the most um, helpful way to think about it would be along a continuum, kind of more or less rural. Um, and usually we do that along two dimensions, um, population density, obviously, but also maybe just as importantly, distance to density, okay? So if you are, you know, a small community, but you're only 15 minutes outside of Edmonton, you know, you're, you're actually far less rural than, you know, maybe a larger community that's, you know, hours and hours away from um, a metropolis center. So well, those are things to just kind of keep in mind when we're thinking about what are we actually talking about when we use the term rural. And I know Jack and, and everyone else who does this rural work in our papers, we have to kind of be a little bit more specific. And again, I won't get into the details now. I will say, however, I am few things raise my blood pressure as high as the way in which the media and even our kind of politicians think and describe rural as everything outside of Edmonton and Calgary. That just does not capture what rural is in any, you know, conceivable way. I will say a little bit about this study that I conducted. Um, it was back in 2019, pre-COVID, so in some ways it feels like a decade ago that, that, that I actually did this. Just now, seeing that up on the screen reminds me, if you want to read this article, it's, I suspect by now it's behind a paywall, um, but track me down and email me, and I'm happy to share it with you if, if this is of interest to you. More or less, back, back in 2018, 2019, I'm thinking about rural political opinion as a rural Alberta myself, you know, what's actually going on here, what are people thinking about politics, and, and more especially, why are they thinking about politics in the way they are? Um, and it was right around that time, too, that I encountered uh, the book that, that uh, Jack uh, mentioned in his, in his um, presentation by Kathy Kramer, the Politics of Resentment, published in 2016, a really kind of innovative way of approaching the question of political opinion, especially in, in, in rural communities. She adopted what she called a political ethno ethnographic design, um, which ethnography can mean a whole lot of different things, I guess, just kind of like rural. Um, but for her, um, it really meant spending time with people, and this is a quote, I just love this quote, so I'm going to read it. Spending time with people as unobtrusively as possible to listen to what individuals say and how members of groups interact with one another in the settings in which they normally meet under the conditions they set for themselves. So what can we actually learn about people and how they're thinking about politics by just spending time with groups of acquaintances and listening to, the, to them talk about politics, right? Not just surveying them or not just putting them in, you know, a focus group or in, trying to interview them, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. What, what could we learn from just listening to regular groups talk about politics? And so, so she went ahead and did this and I thought it was brilliant. So I, I, I copied it, you know, word for word. I did exactly the same thing. So back in, in 2019, I traveled to 16 uh, different communities across, across rural Alberta 
I approached 24, but I ended up only talking to 23. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. But I approached 24 different groups of people just sitting around in coffee shops and restaurants and sporting events and approached them and basically, you know, introduced myself and said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, how rural people are thinking about politics. Do you mind if I sit down and just, you know, join your conversation? And as you can imagine, there's a little bit of eye rolling and kind of groaning. But like I said, I approached 24. I actually sat with 23. One basically is like, no, thank you. But the other 23, you know, allowed me, welcomed me. I mentioned earlier, this was an important kind of methodological point that I am actually from rural Alberta. I admitted to them right off right off the bat, you know, I'm, I'm from rural Alberta as well. That's kind of why I'm interested in these types of questions. And I'll admit that opened some doors for sure in terms of, you know, oh, okay, sit down and, you know, we'll, we'll chat or whatever. So I, I joined the conversation and every once in a while I would throw kind of a, a question aimed at kind of getting them to, to talk a little bit more about politics. But it wasn't an interview, more or less I was just sitting there listening to them talk. And then, you know, of course, they would interact with me and ask me questions and I'd be part of it. It was really just a, uh, um, a way to kind of spend time with folks and, and, and try to understand a little bit better how they're, how they're thinking about politics. There's obviously a lot more detail in the paper. But overall, I, I certainly did come across a lot of political discontentment across pretty much every single group that I, that I sat down with. Again, it, it's more nuanced than this, but in terms of trying to make some sense of it in the paper and, and especially trying to summarize it here for you today, basically you can categorize it around, around three issues. The first one, probably the most unsurprising, the first one says Western alienation. So this idea that Alberta especially is, is chronically you know, mistreated by Ottawa, the federal government, very, very strong. That was basically the first thing that came up. Every time I would say, what are the issues you know you folks care about? It was like Justin Trudeau, right? Like that was, that was the first thing that came up, very, very strong. And again, unsurprising. But once the conversations progressed and you know I listened a little bit more, there were two other things that came up that I thought were actually far more interesting. Number two, politicians are res unresponsive to ordinary people. The folks that I sat with were very, very, you know, strongly of the opinion that they constituted ordinary people, one. But then two, politicians of all stripes. This wasn't just about Trudeau or Notley. It was politicians of all stripes and the political system in general, just largely unresponsive to what ordinary people think and, and kind of the needs of, of, of ordinary people in, in politics. To be honest, in, in almost every single group, they raise the issue of, of party discipline and the power of the leader over the, over the local MLA and, and how angry it made them that their local MLA, in their word, was essentially useless. They weren't hesitant to come, come right out and talk about how they felt this was hugely anti-democratic. And a number of different people across a number of different groups came out and basically said, you know what, politics would be so much better if there were no parties. Okay, which is really interesting, right? We tend to assume, you know, they're going to bed with their, you know, conservative party pajamas on. They're so tied up in, in, in you know, the conservative party. And of course, they lean conservative, and Jack has, uh, Jack has spoken about that. But parties themselves really piss rural people off, to be perfectly honest. This is, I think, an under underappreciated aspect of Alberta politics, the, the degree to which a lot of people, or rural political culture in general, um, is really thinking about representation in ways that rub up against kind of the, the traditional Westminster system of, of, of how, we, how we conduct our politics. And, you know, I, I think it goes a long way to us helping, helping us make some sense of, you know, the, the, the challenges that conservative premiers all the way back to Ralph Klein have had in terms of managing their caucus. It's not just about ideology. It's also about kind of these representation questions and ought the premier and the premier's office really have the power that they do have. It really angers rural, rural folks. Um, and then the third issue, and this gets right, right into this kind of place-based resentment um, topic that Jack was just speaking of. This came up very, very clearly. There was a strong sense that as rural citizens, they were often ignored or even looked down upon by, by urban citizens and urban politicians. So very similar to what has been found in a number of different American studies, including the Kathy Kramer study that, was, that was, has been referenced a few times now. The sense that rural definitely does represent you know, a, a particular particular or unique way of life, kind of on one hand, that, that's distinct from urban life. And it is al also the sense that this type of life is often misunderstood or looked down upon by urban citizens, okay? So there's a real sensitivity there around the notion that folks in Edmonton are basically just making hillbilly jokes about rural most of the time. This definitely fits with kind of the broader literature, again, that, that Jack kind of referenced already, that's, that's emerging, that's, that's recognizing kind of the strong emotional attachment many people, rural and urban, can develop to a place, 
and how you know the subsequent place-based identity can very very quickly become an important lens through which people are interpreting their politics. It's also an identity that can very easily be primed by political elites, right? And I'll, I'll come back to that um, in, in, in a couple of minutes as well. Those were kind of the three main kind of themes of re resentment or alienation that kind of came out when I was speaking. The, the remainder of the paper goes into kind of the implications and, and shows how these different um, alienations or, or feelings of resentment can kind of work together to really become important factors in understanding how rural folks again, that, that I talk to. This, I'm, I'm not claiming this is wholly representative because it wasn't a survey you know, fo following those types of um, methodolo methodological approaches. All of these kind of ways, of ways of thinking about politics definitely kind of melded together and helped me understand far better why so many folks that I spoke with were, were really engaging in kind of the anti-establishment type politics. And this, this presented itself as a distrust of the mainstream media, an interested Wexit or, you know, Alberta separatism, but especially, and this is, again, remember this is 2019 now, so it makes a little bit more sense, an overwhelming, you know, sense of a, a approval for Donald Trump. That came up in many, many of my questions. And again, you're probably thinking, Donald Trump, oh my God, you know, think of all the, you know, ridiculous things he does and says. For most of the folks I spoke with, there's a strong sense that Donald Trump was represented someone finally speaking up for ordinary people. It was tied up in that idea. You know, that's one thing that's kind of going on. And, and another thing that came up, came up as, as well definitely was, you know, how these different forms of resentment really influence how these real folks were thinking about the plight of newcomers to Canada and especially Indigenous Canadians. And it, again, this was largely wrapped up in this sense that essentially this would be something that someone would tell me that isn't it true that, you know, governments, provincial or national, will bend over backwards, you know, to, to support newcomers, refugees, Indigenous Canadians, but what are they doing about rural communities, right? This strong sense of being overlooked and, and, and left behind. And, you know, what, to the degree that the, that's factual is kind of off to the side. This is how they're thinking about um, these issues. A bit more context to try and help us understand maybe where these kind of views are coming from. Over the last 20 or 30 years, there has definitely been an economic transformation rooted largely in, in neoliberalism that has led to, you know, especially in rural communities, to steal a phrase from, from my colleague John Parkins, there has been a delinking of rural industry from rural community. And by that, I mean, there still is an awful lot of money being made by extracting and producing rurally derived products. So, egg, oil and gas, manufacturing to a degree. But this money, by and large, is not remaining in and circulating in rural communities in the way that it did 30, 40, 50 years ago. You tease out the implications of that. Essentially, you know, job prospects, especially for, you know, good, well-paying jobs in rural communities, it's obviously bleaker than, than you'd find in, ur in urban communities. And, you know, to, to add an extra layer to that, we've had success of Alberta provincial governments now who, you know, they say all the right things about rural and talk about agriculture and oil and gas and all the rest, but none of them have actually come up with a meaningful rural economic development plan beyond just, again, talking about the extractive industries and kind of encouraging more extraction or, you know, advancing agricultural production or what have you. And these things don't actually lead to, again, enhanced economic activity by and large in, in, in rural communities. There's definitely been, again, over that same period, a very real erosion of public services in rural communities from, from healthcare to prim primary education to infrastructure to social service supports. All of that has been very strongly on the decline in, in rural communities, and they feel that in, in, in their everyday lives. Property crime, this is something that's real in, in, in rural areas the last 10, 15 years. There's been a marked increase in property crime that's, the experts obviously, you know, have shown us that this is definitely wrapped up in kind of the rising rising tide of addiction issues uh, we, have in, we have in our province, but it's something that's there. There aren't many people in rural areas that haven't been victim or, you know, don't know a victim of, of, of rural crime, and this is something that's property crime, and this is something that really kind of activates the sense of, like, Who's, who's actually on our side here. I didn't put this on there, but I, I would say there, there's probably a, a broader disorientation around kind of cultural changes that has been happening over the last 20, 30 years as well. That's this kind of happening in rural areas, similar to, you know, this is something that's linked to the, the broader kind of global rise of kind of right-wing um, 
populism. I think that's 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 true of, of rural areas as well. So you kind of step back. There's been you know these economic or governmental or cultural changes that in in many ways have put rural communities and rural citizens on it on the defensive. So you know, and as soon as you're on the defensive, suddenly you are that much more, you know, primed to to you know fall into kind of this resentment trap. Let me let me put it that way. To be stoked, to be thinking about these things from this angle. Um, and then you know, on the other side of the coin, and 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 Jack already spoke to a lot of this. Undoubtedly, you know, rural communities, rural citizens tend to lean to the conservative side. Um, I think. Um, one of Jack's colleagues, Dr. Melanie Thomas at the University of Calgary, has done some re really interesting work showing that in many ways this is more of an identity connection than an ideology connection. And Jack just showed there, there's definitely kind of a distinct you know, divide between urban and rural in terms of ide ideology. This wasn't brought up in the presentation, but it, when you looked at all the different graphs that Jack put up there, people, people in rural communities were definitely a little bit more right than urban, but it's not like they were far right. Right, they're they're still closer to the center than they are to the far right. But there's this sense that we assume that ideologically they're you know as right as Daniel Smith is, and by and large they're not. That doesn't escape the fact that um, you know they they identify with the conservative party, and thus many of them identify with conservative leaning media. I call it here the rage farming, the engaging with conspiracy theory, the you know the stoking the resentment, trying to put it on Trudeau or Hinchar or Notley or whatever that happens from conservative parties so often. There's an appetite for that in rural communities, give, given that kind of connection to to um, you know conservative parties and conservative media and what have you. Having said all this, I, I, I want to raise actually a critique of my own work. So Dr. Roger Epp, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that name. He's a prof here at at, at the U of A one of the most knowledgeable uh, people about rural Alberta that, that I know of and writes a lot of really, really kind of insightful stuff about what's really going on in, in, in rural communities. This might even be the t title of the chapter, Rural Alberta is Always More Than It Seems, coming out in, in a book called Blue Storm, which is coming out in, it's like on the rise and fall of Jason Kenney. You're going to see it. There'll be some press around it. I think it's coming out in the new year. But he has this really, really great chapter in there where essentially he, he, he tries to make the point that rural Alberta is far more nuanced than we tend to assume it is on all, all kinds of different issues, you know, it's always more than what it, what it seems. It's not nearly as homogeneous as often assumed. And he, he makes the point in the chapter that, that, that I've had, had the chance to see already, rural Albertans are very much alarmed at the state of healthcare in rural communities. They, they're, they're living through not having family doctors, having to drive even further to seek care and, and, and what have you. They know that ambulances aren't coming to get them if they, or, you know, if they, if, if they need them. So there, there's a lot of, um, suspicion around what the UCP is doing with healthcare in, in rural communities, despite what you know the, the MLAs speak to. Interestingly, almost all rural school boards across the province declined to pilot the UCP's you know, ideological social studies curriculum. It wasn't just the Edmonton Public School Board that stood up. Rural school boards, too, didn't want any part of that curriculum. And again, that's a story that's not often told. It was primarily a, a rural groundswell, really, that I think at least temporarily put a halt on plans to um, mine the eastern, eastern slopes of the Rockies. There were a lot of rural people who were really angry about that in southern Alberta. The rural municipalities of Alberta, the group that represents rural politicians across the province, have really been dogged in their criticism of the UCP on a number of different issues, from infrastructure to health care to um, the unpaid taxes of oil and gas companies. They're hugely opposed to a provincial police force. Again, this is something that, again, I think people in Edmonton just think, oh, rural people want this police force, so that's we're going to end up with it. Rural people, especially you know, rural politicians who know and have done the math, are hugely against a provincial police force because they know it's not going to address the crime issue and it's just going to cost a bunch of money. More broadly, you know, the pandemic. So again, my study was before the pandemic. Since the pandemic, again, the media routinely depicts rural Alberta as, you know, the spiritual home of the of the convoy folks. It's, you know, anti-mask, anti-vax, you know, central. You go out there, my God, you're obviously going to catch something because, you know, it's just all circulating out there. Again, there's research out that shows by Jack's colleague, Dr. Dr. Thomas, again from U of C, that shows that at the height of the pandemic, rural folks were just as concerned as urban folks about the potential, you know, health implications of, of, of catching the virus. It was a big deal out there. But of course, we hear the story that, well, no, it's just, 
you know, they don't care about it and don't wear masks and what have you. And even, even the vaccine rate, this is pulled from like AHS website or something, referring to how many Albertans actually got two shots of, of the vaccination, you know, the first go around when we thought that was going to be enough. The orange represents between 60 and 80 percent of the population who went out and got the vaccine. Obviously, there's a little bit of variation in, in different parts, but by and large, throughout rural Alberta, it's, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 70% went and got two shots. And again, is that 85 or 90 or 95 that you see in some Edmonton or Calgary communities? No, of course it's lower. But the idea that, you know, no one out there is getting, getting a shot and it's just anti-science central is, is simply not true. Okay. Even even in terms of supporting the con the freedom convoy that happened, Jared Wesley, who's produce, uh, who's you know presenting in the, in the next room, has some has some data out there that shows a, a good chunk, like a majority of rural rural Albertans, were not in support of the convoy. Okay. So all of this is to say, you know, we need a little bit of nuance when we're thinking about what rural Alberta is. It's not nearly as you know hopelessly anti-science as sometimes is, is 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 depicted. It's not nearly as hopelessly you know conservative. This is again from a CDC article, a recent Janet Brown poll. This I'm I'm afraid does kind of collapse rural into everything but Edmonton and Calgary. But notice the difference in support for the UCP from 2019 to 2022 has gone down considerably. Like they still have a plurality of support, but it's nowhere near as drastic as we tend to assume. Part of the issue when we talk about what, going forward, what are we supposed to do with you know the urban rural divide and growing resentment and what have you, it probably starts with just, you know, making sure we're not assuming too much in terms of thinking about what's actually going on in, in rural areas and what the, what the attitudes actually are. Just kind of return to my own research that I spoke earlier. Even though I try to give a little bit more nuance, rural Alberta isn't quite what you think it is. I think that discontent is there. I think it is widespread. I think it's rooted in this sense that, you know, urban folks, urban, urban politicians are not listening to us. When I would go and approach these groups, and like I said, when I when I first went up them went up to them, there was a lot of eye rolling, a lot of groaning. By the time it was over, so many of those groups, so many of the individuals within so many of the groups, basically expressed to me this deep gratitude for taking the time to just sit and listen to them talk. Right? And to be honest, I wasn't expecting that. I thought, oh man, I'm you know I'm wasting their time. I bet I'm really angering them by you know interrupting their coffee group or whatever. But they were so happy that someone was actually stopping to listen to them. And again, this is just a, a tiny little thing, just a few coffee groups. But I think there's a really big hint there in terms of thinking about moving forward. The resentment that, that does exist too, I, I will say, I, I think it is, is far more latent than you might find in, in, in rural America. These, these folks aren't frothing at the mouth ready to storm the ledge. If you ask a lot of rural people what they think about politics, they'll tell you government doesn't listen, no one cares about rural, Everyone thinks we're just a bunch of hicks. But then they'll just go about their day, right? It's not top of mind, which means it's probably, you know, a good time to make sure it doesn't get out of control, right? We seem to be always three or four years behind the United States in, in, in some of this stuff. So, you know, if you're not careful, we are going to have the storming of the ledge, right? How you address this, again, this is a huge you know, huge issue, you know, part of it is symbolic, this notion of, you know, is someone listening? I think some of it is, though, material. It is are we actually, you know, generating public policy that addresses the problems with rural healthcare, rural education, rural economic development, right? Rural social service delivery. The NDP, I'm afraid, was really no different. They didn't do much for rural communities along many of these, these scores either, or along many of these topics. I really do think we need to think clearly about applying a rural lens to the, the policy that we do put forward. Rural communities have very distinct needs, very distinct capacities that need to be accounted for when, when we're talking about policy. Thinking about these types of policies is far more fruitful, obviously, than, you know, what the Conservatives tend to do, which is, again, just try and stoke resentment and blame Trudeau and Notley and Hinshaw and whoever else. Um, that's certainly not the answer. And, and, and I'm meant to be totally nonpartisan in this, but it's clear that, you know, conservative parties tend to kind of push there. There's not a lot of ideas around rural development in, in conservative either beyond that damn Trudeau won't let us build a, build a you know, pipeline. Um, so I, I wish there was a little bit more focus there on actual issues. Having said all this, I, 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 I don't want to leave or, or, or let rural folks off the hook completely. Like, I, th I think there is more that has to be done in rural communities from within to really focus on what the actual policy issues are that would actually make life in rural communities better and be politically active 
on those issues rather than getting up, getting hung up on the Trudeau and Hinchon Notley train. Um, but I will say, and this is this is huge conjecture, but it'll be the, my, my last point. I, I often wonder if rural folks lack of focus on actual local issues and being politically engaged on those local issues in rural communities. I, I really suspect there's something wrapped up in the death of local newspapers um, in that. We don't talk about that very often. There is a little bit of research out there, and I haven't done any of it, but I, I think that's an important point to consider. You know, why aren't rural communities, why aren't rural citizens more, more in active and, and, and screaming out loud about the actual policy issues that their community face, as opposed to just, you know, hanging F. Trudeau signs on, on, on their, you know, pickup trucks? And I think there's something there. I'll leave it there. Thank you. My question is really on religion versus secularism. There's salience of religion in rural Alberta, particularly regard to energy, energy development. I'm thinking of a brilliant book by a former Edmontonian, Darren Dochuk, Anointed with Oil, How Christianity and Crude Made Modern America. And involved with that process were evangelicals, that in terms of religion, Alberta was really linked into that system of development of oil in North America, a very important part of it. In terms of rural Alberta, are there differences between urban uh, religion versus secularism? Is there a place there in terms of the residual effects of religion that it would be much more favorable for the development of oil and other energy resources in rural Alberta? I'm familiar with the book you mentioned. I would encourage you to, to in, in terms of the historical connection between religion and Alberta politics and the free market and oil and all the rest. Um, I wrote a book on that as well in the Alberta context uh, called God's Province, and it speaks to this connection between Manning and this evangelical Christianity and, and, and the importance of freedom in that kind of very individualistic type of Protestantism and how it was linked to free marketism and, and the development of the oil industry. That's a question I have too. I don't have a good answer other than to say, I continue to think about, I'm, as you can guess, you know, given the title of that, that book I just referenced, I've always been really interested in kind of religion and politics in Alberta and the rural angle. I've dug around for data on this. There isn't a lot out there that really conclusively shows that rural Albertans are in fact that much more religious or religiously active than, than urban Albertans. But I still always have this kind of gut sense that it is true to some degree. But how it's connected now, like I, I have the same questions to, to the oil industry, but also, you know, to the, to the factions of rural Alberta that did kind of fall down the, the convoy, conspiracy theory, rabbit hole. There seems to be an interesting religious component to that as well. Deserves a lot more attention than we've given it, and that's kind of one of the topics that I'd like to get into sooner, but I wish I had a better answer than that. But. Yeah, I mean, you could see a glimmer of that in that question about traditional family values, which is uh, strongly related to somebody's, the character of somebody's religiosity and the presence of religiosity. I'm working on a, a project right now where if you think about the urban-rural divide in Canada, you can think about the different components of that divide. Where does it come from? Part of where it comes from is that different sorts of people live in urban and rural places. So uh, rural Canada is, is, tends to be older, whiter. You know, it has uh, demographic differences from uh, the downtown of Calgary or the downtown of Toronto. And, those, and so part of the divide has to do with different kinds of people live in different sorts of places. And so that will produce an urban-rural divide even if there's no actual kind of place-based effects. But it's clear that that doesn't explain all of what's going on with the urban-rural divide and that there are these meaningful place-based effects that have to do with the local economy, local cultural history, and so on. So on specifically on religion, one thing you see, you know, I was as part of this project looking at some uh, voting patterns. Now, these were federal voting patterns. One of the strongest demographic predictors of uh, how you vote, one of the strongest gaps uh, in, in how Canadians vote is whether they're uh, evangelical Protestant or not. So it has to do with um, religiosity, yes, but also the particular character of the religiosity. And so I think there's, it is the case that evangelical Protestantism is more common in rural Ontario, in rural Alberta, in rural BC. And so that's another one of those demographic factors that, that matters. I think that that is an important component of this. But even when we account for that, there's still a lot left over 
for these places um, to sort of be influencing people in the way they think about politics and the different parties and so forth. I have a question for each of you. The first for Jack, my question about the data, it's relatively comparable to the rest of Canada, but I wonder if there is a difference at all or if you know if there's data that would point to a difference in terms of like how they're ranked in terms of preference. If the only substantial gap is in terms of like economic and industry sort of questions, would that be ranked on average higher than it would in other parts of Canada? And then how big would be the gap between that ranking and then the next thing on the list? And I wonder if that would make it perhaps a little bit paint a more fulsome picture or if there's anything about that. And then the other thing I wanted to point ask Clark was, I also love Kathy Kramer's book. One of the things I really liked about it as well, having lived in both urban and, and rural communities and having ties there, is the way that she points out that like rural folks often feel like, yes, that they're looked down upon, that they're made of caricatures, but that they also then make caricatures of urbanites that are also incorrect, right? That they actually think of them mostly as like these elites, which is a very small minority of people, and actually like the poverty, the disparity that people live with in urban centers is actually quite comparable to the conditions that they feel are left out. Instead of like maybe looking to like solutions in government, I was wondering if you had any sense of what could be done, maybe specifically in the Albertan context to build solidarities between urban and rural divides that way. I think about in Ontario, it was one of the first things I thought about when they like cut the greyhound line, right? And like physically alienating the rural from the urban centers. What sort of also attacks we might see on those solidarities and how that benefits, I think, political parties. Great question. Thank you very much. It seems like everyone who's uh, interested in and studies urban rural divides grew up in rural somewhere. I, I grew up in rural Ontario as well, and so I don't know, there's a pattern there uh, someone needs to explore. It's absolutely clear that the way issues affect politics is not just what people think on the issues, but what issues people think are important, and what issues enter the policy agenda. When you look at issue importance scores from survey data in Canada, um, based on what I've seen, you see a similar kind of pattern where issue importance is certainly differs across urban and rural places, and uh, so you have very, very large gaps in, is, in, in how much how important people perceive a given issue to be. That's more true across Canada, I think, than it's true provincially because of the way that the the, the policy issues shake out jurisdictionally. That that things like healthcare and education are. There's less of a gap there because there are, thing, there are things that sort of everyone cares about, whether they live in rural or, or urban Canada. Whereas on something like the carbon tax, you get urban representatives saying, well, just switch to transit. And then you get people who live in rural Canada saying, thanks very much for your advice, but that's, that's not a realistic advice for me. I have found so far that the same patterns apply. So you see in Alberta a distinct intercept shift, so to speak, on what issues are important across Albertans, whether they live in Calgary or in, in Brooks or wherever, but uh, similar kind of magnitudes of urban-rural divides on issue importance. But there's a lot more to explore there. I totally agree with you that the assumptions that you know, both sides are making are caricatures. When rural folks come into Edmonton to go to an Oilers game, they're not looking around at the rest of the crowd saying, look at those urbanites, right? Because that's not who they have in their mind as the, the problem. The problem are, like you say, the elites. The, the, uh, what exactly is that? Is that you know political, academic, public service elites? I don't know. I'd, like, if you press them on that, they probably wouldn't be able to give you a better answer. But the, the caricature, caricature thing is, is is real. Is part of the solution you know found in just building some authentic bridges? Absolutely, right. And I'm I'm glad you brought that up because it isn't just about let's address some of these rural concern, rural policy concerns. How you do that? I bet you have better ideas than even I in terms of you know what, what would that look like. But thinking about that, I think, is absolutely crucial going forward. Again, to, to, to make sure the resentment levels don't come from here to there. And then we are seeing kind of some of the crazy stuff that you, know, you see in, in south of the border. One of the potential roles for um, places like Parkland, I think, is to be aware of these opportunities to build divides across urban and rural places. Let's face it, the political parties in the electoral arena operating under strong resource constraints have strong incentives to target their attention to particular kinds of places that are likely to be receptive to their messages. Plus, the caucuses that get elected to these parties, to the extent that there's an urban-rural divide in those caucuses, 
tend to uh, re-emphasize the kinds of divides that um, they tend to be more likely to emphasize divisive issues than shared issues. So there's, there's lots of incentives inside the institutions of our provincial and federal politics that um, incentivize pl the playing up of urban-rural divides. But you'll have noticed on those issue questions I showed, there's very few where actually the majority in rural Canada is on one side and the majority in urban Canada is on the other. So even though there are these gaps, sometimes really big ones, it's very often the case that basically everyone is on the same side of the issue. They're just kind of like what you pointed out on, on, the, on the vaccination uptake, that you might have a majority uptake everywhere, um, but the size of that majority is going to vary. So I think that's really important and that we and others um, face, who don't face those kinds of incentives, I think it's unrealistic to say um, to the NDP or to any party, well, you just have to devote massive resources to the, the campaigns um, all across the the province, because it's, a, it's an unrealistic picture of how elections work, but I don't face those constraints. You know, we don't face those same constraints. And so there's a real important um, priority, I think, for us to, to speak across that, those seeming divides. So thank you for the presentations. And I want to say I come from a rural area too, but I disagree with you wholeheartedly. I don't see a rural uh, resentment. I see a conservative resentment. Some of the things that like, you guys talked about today, so like Clark, when you talked about some considerations at the end, you even brought up the broader confusion around cultural issues. What does that really mean? That's broader confusion of a moving away from a heteronormative, like nuclear family, white, European background. That doesn't sound very rural as much as very conservative. Your other three major points were Western alienation. I failed to remember when Western alienation was a problem under Harper. It seems to be like a conservative alienation. They get alienated when a liberal party's in power. You talked about ordinary people. This ordinary people as in white, heteronormative, older, the demographic questions that you guys talked about who tend to skew towards conservative. Maybe I'm too Nietzschean, but I see a resentment. And it's not just an erosion of services. It's not just we want better health care. It's we want better health care and those queer people like Brendan in the city can go live in the streets again. This family value stuff, they didn't talk about it, like in the 80s, for example, it was about Reagan. But Reagan was, and Nancy were pretty mean to queer people. They weren't Tammy Faye. They weren't the, that rural, like, compassionate conservative. What they wanted was anger. What they wanted was resentment. I'm just wondering if we're just whitewashing it when we call it rural conservative, like, resentment instead of conservative resentment, the way our society is heading. Thank you, Brendan. I know Brendan from a past life. In many ways, I think you're absolutely on to something, of course, both in terms of, you know, what is rural about this, although I would say the place-based resentment stuff, we can't pretend that that's not rural-based. Is it wrapped up in traditionalism, traditional values? I think absolutely it is, and I, there are some American scholars who are following up on Kramer's work that are, that are doing a lot of really interesting work on this and trying to show their are obviously you know, important connections with that. I would be a little bit careful, just even in terms of the aggressiveness of your comments, like, well, actually, these people just don't want the queer, queers living in, in rural communities. Of course, are, are there some people who think that? Of course there are. There are in Edmonton, too. There are lots of you know, groups in rural communities that are doing lots of progressive work around those issues. So you know, it, it's, it's not, none of this is kind of you know, blank. We can't use blanket statements to talk about rural resentment, but we can't kind of make assumptions about, you know, what rural people are really into or not into as, as well. Um, but to the broader point, you know, is this connected to conservatism, traditionalism, you know, un undoubted. Just to add, this is maybe somewhat unsatisfying and needlessly analytical, but tradition of research on this that has been showing that, yes, are, are, are racial resentment and rural resentment related to each other? Absolutely. Are they distinct phenomena? Also, yes. These don't just collapse into um, conservative ideology or racial resentment. This has been a, a common critique of Kathy Kramer's work, that isn't this ultimately about racial resentment in the American context? And, and so there's a lot of work that's been trying to disentangle these things. It's extremely complicated because you can't realistically disentangle these things. They live inside the heads of factual people. To the extent that it has been possible to do that, there's pretty good evidence that, that racial resentment doesn't explain all of the kind of phenomena that you're pointing to, but it's an important part of how people come to behave politically in a different way in rural parts of Canada than they do in suburban or urban parts of Canada. It's not everything, but it's, it's part of the story.
Can we give a big thank you to our speakers today? Thank you so much.